donc aujourd'hui nous avons le plaisir de recevoir Geoffroy Le Sur pour ce e-séminaire euh, IAP. Donc euh, Geoffroy est chercheur CNRS à l'IPAG à Grenoble. C'est à Grenoble qu'il a préparé sa thèse, puis il a passé après quelques années de postdoc à Cambridge avant de revenir donc, euh, à l'IPAG. Ses sujets de recherche sont euh, la physique des disques d'accrétion, l'hydrodynamique, la turbulence MHD, les vents dans les disques, dynamo, ces, ces questions-là, donc appliquées aux disques de formation planétaire également dans les c'est la question autour des variables cataclysmiques. Geoffroy est responsable d'un projet ERC consacré à la modélisation des listes de formation planétaire. Il enseigne également, notamment dans le M2 de Grenoble. Et donc aujourd'hui, il nous présente un séminaire intitulé Dynamics of Planet Forming Disc, The Role of Magnetized Winds. Donc Geoffroy, je t'en prie. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je ne sais pas, est-ce que je le fais en français ou en anglais Je ne sais pas quelle est votre préférence. En anglais Oui, so, en anglais. En anglais, ok. Uh, so, thank you for, for the invitation. And um, uh, I would have loved to be uh, in Paris today uh, to discuss with you all. Uh, unfortunately, this will not happen, at least not today. Um, so, uh, this uh, seminar is going to be about uh, the dynamics of uh, planet forming disk and uh, I will try to give you a sort of overview of uh, the, the recent evolution uh, of our understanding of, of these objects and, um, and how this can change our understanding of current uh, observations which you might have heard about. Um, okay, so this, uh, this work is uh, mostly done by uh, postdocs and uh, PhD students, uh, so namely Antoine Riol, who is uh, a postdoc with me uh, today at IPAG, William Bethune, who was a PhD student uh, with me and who is now in Tübingen, and um, with the assistance of all the people from IPAG and uh, several other places. Right, so... Um, The menu for today uh, is the following. I will try to give you uh, an appetizer of uh, accretion theory, uh, very short, um, to give you an overview of what we understand about accretion theory. And then I will discuss um, some um, observations related to accretion, how we can constrain accretion in uh, protoplanetary disks, and uh, what, what we can deduce uh, from uh, the most recent observations with uh, ALMA, for instance, and Sphere. And finally, uh, a magnetized wind souffle, um, uh, where I will try to explain uh, how magnetized wind can actually be the main uh, driver of uh, the dynamics of these objects, or actually a driver which uh, should not be neglected uh, when modelizing these objects. Right, so let's start with uh, accretion theory in a nutshell. And before that, uh, let me uh, explain a bit and give you some uh, fancy picture of what we are talking about today. So today we are talking about protoplanetary disks, which are disks found around uh, forming stars. Um, we have on the left here uh, an example of a, a disk uh, seen edge on. So the disk is really the thin layer right here uh, in the middle, so it's obscuring the central object. And we see light which is scattered by floating dust on both sides of the disk. And we have associated to this uh, thin disk in the middle, we have a, a jet, an outflow, which you can see here, which is well collimated. Uh, and you have another uh, tiny uh, piece here. So what we see here is essentially the same thing which is here an artist's view, where we see the dark layer, which is a disk, and Uh, the, the top and bottom layer, which are illuminated uh, by the central object. So the temperatures of these disks are relatively cold. It ranges from 10 to 1000 kelvins. And the size typically ranges from 0.1 AU, which is the size of the magnetosphere, up to a few hundred AUs. It really depends on the kind of disk you are looking at. Um, That being said, uh, we now have uh, lots of observations in which we do resolve uh, these disks. And uh, here are some examples. Uh, first, uh, seen in scattered light, so that's uh, infrared emission. What you are probing here is really uh, the disk surface. Um, and you see several features. You see, for instance, spiral arms, as uh, you can see here and here. Uh, you're, you can also see ring-like features, um, which might not be obvious here, but you have one ring here, another one here, and possibly another one here. 
Um, so these are the typical uh, features we see at the surface, power arms, um, uh, wings, and also uh, some um, long-lived non axisymmetric features. And if you now move to uh, the submillimetric French, as uh, for instance, probed by the ALMA telescope, then uh, we will cover some of these um, features. So again, we have rings and we have rings in almost every system. So that's a disk seen from the top, TW Hydra. That's an image of HL Tau, which has been deprojected. I'm sure you have all heard about that. Um, here we have another object where we see uh, some sort of non axisymmetric uh, structure seen in the submillimetric range, and which is believed to be possibly a, a vortex lying in the, in the disk. And here we also see uh, spiral arms, um, one here and another one here, uh, which is reminiscent of uh, sphere images. So, uh, as you can see, these disks are uh, structured um, uh, and they are not homogeneous as uh, what people thought uh, originally in the 90s. So that's one element. Uh, the other element, as I told you uh, at the beginning, is that these disks are often observed in association with uh, large-scale uh, jets and outflows. Uh, so here's an example. It is uh, HH30, so it's the same object I've shown you at the, at the very beginning of this seminar. Uh, so once more, the disk is seen edge on, it's here. So we still see the, the scattered light from the disk surface. We see the jet right in the middle. And uh, in addition to that, if you now look to a molecular line emission uh, in the simulimetric range, you observe something which is broader this sort of blue cloud here, which is actually uh, outflowing. And um, you can see that it's not as collimated as the jet in, in the middle. It's more like a, a conical kind of shape. Um, and if you now look at uh, the accretion rate uh, in this particular object, for instance, you find that uh, the disk is accreting, at least on the central object, at uh, um, an M dot, which is around uh, 10 to minus 8 solar mass is per year. Uh, the jet itself is uh, 10 times less of that, but molec the molecular wind has a mass loss rate, which is actually larger than the mass accretion rate, which is quite surprising to me. Um, and I will come back to that later. Uh, oh, talking about- how, uh, Jeffrey, how reliable are these accretion rates? Because they, they are not observed, they are derived by, by, with some assumptions. How, what, yes. what are the error bars on this? It's um, something like a factor of a few up to an order of magnitude. Uh, agreed, granted, it's not, uh, I mean, for this particular object, it's not directly observed, uh, it's deduced. Uh, there are some other objects in which it is observed. So here's an example of um, like a population of objects in which uh, the accretion rate is inferred from the luminosity of the accretion shock at the stellar surface. Um, and um, so, okay, you have a whole family. This is the mass of the star versus the accretion rate once more measured uh, into the accretion columns. And you see that it ranges from uh, 10 to minus 10 for the smallest masses uh, up to 10 to minus seven for uh, the uh, kind of solar masses um, stars. And if you believe in it, you can see a sort of slope here. Um, which tells you that the mass accretion rate tends to increase with the mass of the central star. So bottom line is that these objects typically accrete with a typical mass accretion rate, which is 10 to minus eight solar masses per year onto the central star. Okay, uh, does it yes, does it address your question, Jean-Pierre? I was saying thank you for the answer. Okay. Um, right, so that's, that's, you know, that's a framework. Um, now, we need to understand uh, how these objects are accreting, and that's going to be uh, the, the second part of this talk, um, uh, so the appetizer, so to say. Um, so uh, if you want to have mass accretion onto uh, any object, be it um, a young stellar object or a black hole, uh, you need to evacuate the angular momentum of the falling material. Otherwise, you stay on a circular orbit. So the question of mass accretion is 
tightly related to the question of angular momentum transport. You need to get rid of the angular momentum. For that, you have essentially two mechanisms which have been proposed. The first one is the so-called viscous disk. So it's, uh, the model is uh, that you assume that the disk is highly viscous. And with this viscosity, the angular momentum is transported outward inside the disk simply by due to the fact that each annulus of the, of the disk is viscous, so you have uh, transmission of angular momentum between the annuli uh, by viscous friction. So uh, uh, physically, what is believed is that uh, these disks are turbulent, and this turbulence can be described as um, a sort of effective viscosity. So you can define a turbulent viscosity, nu t here, which is proportional to the sound speed inside the disk times the disk thickness. And the proportionality constant is simply this dimensionless number, alpha, which if you want to match the uh, accretion rates which are observed, need to be between 10 to minus three and 10 to minus one, depending on the kind of objects you are looking at. So that's the viscous disk model, also known as the alpha disk or chakra senyaev disk model. Next to that, we have uh, the magnetized wind scenario. This time, uh, the angular momentum is extracted away from the disk. It's not staying inside the disk, it moves into uh, an outflow and then it leaves vertically. So, um, um, of course, you need to have some mechanism to extract this angular momentum, and it's tightly related to the fact that you must have a magnetic field, and I will come back to that later. Now, uh, this mechanism uh, is due to the presence of a large scale torque which slows down the disk, so it cannot be described by an alpha disk uh, by, by construction. So, um, uh, if you look back historically uh, in time, it turns out that uh, the viscous disk has been uh, will be mostly favored in the literature. Um, and as I used to say, uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, life was easy. Uh, for several reasons, and I think you will mostly all agree with that. Uh, first, um, as you know, the United Kingdom was a member of the European Union, and there was no question about that. Uh, surprisingly, it was easy because George Bush was the US president. Who would have thought that one would say it was easy? Uh, of course, we do not have to wear masks at all times, which is kind of annoying. And um, we had a very good reason to believe that disks were turbulent, thanks to this uh, instability known as the magnetorotational instability, which has been described in 1991 by John Hurley and uh, Steve Balbus. So this instability is essentially uh, an MHD instability, which requires some sort of uh, strong coupling between the field line and the plasma. And this instability is known to produce an alpha, which is of the order of magnitude required by the accretion rate, which is observed. So the viscous disk model was fully justified by the fact that, well, you should have MRI-driven turbulence everywhere in every possible accretion disk. So the viscous disk model is um, you know, justified by the fact that we have a physical mechanism which is plausible in these objects. Life was easy. It turns out that if you want to play that game in a protoplanetary disk, it's more complicated than it seems. The reason is that the magnetorotational instability, as I said, rely on MHD, uh, which, um, which is almost ideal, namely that you need to have a strong coupling between the field lines and the flow, uh, which means that you need to have a pretty high ionization fraction in the system so that you have a good coupling between the charges and the, and the field lines. So if we look now at protoplanetary disks, um, and we ask what are the ionization sources to actually create a real plasma in disks? Well, it turns out that we don't have that many sources. The first and most obvious uh, source of uh, ionization is thermal ionization. And that's gonna work only in the innermost regions of the disk where you, you reach temperatures which are above typically a thousand Kelvin. Next, you need to rely on non-thermal processes. Um, you have several of them. You have X-rays and far UVs, which can be emitted from the forming stars. Uh, and uh, these uh, non-thermal ionization, uh, non-thermal uh, photons are going to ionize mostly the uppermost layers of the disk. Uh, and finally, you can have cosmic rays, 
which if they manage to penetrate inside the forming system, which is not granted, uh, will ionize mostly the uh, outer layers at a relatively low fraction. And we are left with a very large zone here where you need to rely on the disintegration of some unstable elements, for instance. So you, you, you are in a situation where the ionization fraction turns out to be pretty low. That means that the usual magnetohydrodynamic um, equations need to be modified to, to take into account the fact that you have actually very few free electrons in the gas phase. Um, that's usually done by including several non-ideal MHD effects. There are three of them. Ohmic diffusion, which is essentially due to a collision between electrons and uh, neutral atoms and molecules in the system. Ambipolar diffusion, which is due to ion neutrals collisions. And finally, the whole effect, which is uh, due to a drift. It's not a collisional. It's due to a drift between electrons and ions. And the amplitude of each of these effects is going to depend strongly on the location and on the composition of the disk. So at this stage, um, you need to do uh, chemical modeling, uh, you need to uh, do ionization modeling uh, to compute the amplitude of these effects. And this has been done by a number of authors. Uh, that's pretty complicated, but the end result turns out to be quite simple. So let me first focus on ohmic diffusion, and I will then later focus on orbipolar diffusion. So ohmic diffusion, you can compute how strong is ohmic diffusion in such a system. And the result is uh, the following. What's shown here is a plot showing you um, uh, the effective, let's say, Reynolds number um, in a disk model um, as a function of radius and altitude above uh, the disk midplane. Um, and what's shown here again is uh, the magnetic Reynolds number. And it's known that the, magne uh, the, the magnetorotational instability is stabilized whenever the magnetic Reynolds number is uh, smaller than one. So it means that this region here inside, which is bluish, is going to be stable for the magnetorotational instability. And that led to the concept of dead zone. That's a zone in which the magnetorotational instability uh, is quenched by ohmic diffusion. Uh, it turns out that uh, this zone is relatively small and you can survive by saying that, well, you know, you have as upper layers here which are, st which are still pretty dense and in which you can sustain MRI-driven turbulence. So, you know, you can have accretion up there by an alpha disk and, and well, you can find a way around so that this thing works. It turns out that omic diffusion is not the only diffusion process. And as I said, we also have omnipolar diffusion. So here's the same plot, but this time showing the Reynolds number for omnipolar diffusion. So we still have the dead zone due to omic diffusion, which is here. And what you can see is that you have this very large region, which is thicker and much more extended uh, radially, in which the omnipolar uh, Reynolds number turns out to be um, uh, of order one. And it turns out that uh, it's been shown uh, in the 90s that whenever this number, this Reynolds number is smaller than 100, then the MRI is suppressed. That means that the dead zone is not just that, it's much larger. And this was only realized in uh, 2010, 2011. That leads to the extended dead zone problem. And that means that most of the disk actually turns out to be uh, dead. And in, it turns out that the MRI in principle should, be, should not be active uh, in this very wide region. Um, so that turns out to be a theoretical problem. How do you get actually accretion in the systems? And of course, uh, in order to uh, ascertain this, this point, um, you need to turn to observers and ask them, okay, uh, at, at this stage we have a problem, so what can you tell us about uh, the dynamics of the systems? And it turns out that uh, observations actually tell us a lot uh, about um, accretion processes. So the first thing you can do uh, when uh, you are looking at this problem is to try to directly probe whether or not the disk is turbulent. It's not an easy task, uh, to be honest. And uh, the reason why it's not an easy task is that uh, the turbulence which is expected uh, because of the magnetorotational instability, 
should be uh, subsonic. Uh, so the delta V due to the turbulence should be smaller than the sound speed, and the sound speed itself is much smaller than the key appliance speed, the, the mean rotation speed of the disk. So it's very difficult because uh, the turbulence uh, broadening of, uh, say, your me molecular line is going to be much smaller than the broadening of the mean capillary motion and due to the thermal broadening um, of the system. Nevertheless, this measure has been attempted by uh, the group uh, of uh, Kevin Flaherty in, in several objects. They did that on, on several CO lines. And the end result is that the turbulent velocity, which is measured, in the systems is smaller than 4% 4 of the sound speed. And that is much smaller than expected, what is expected from MRI turbulence, which should be around 10 to 20% of the sound speed. So that's an indication that, that probably uh, turbulence, if any, should be weaker than what you would expect from MRI turbulence. And as you would guess from the fact that it's weakly ionized. So that's one indication, but it's not the only one. There is a probe of turbulence in these objects, and this probe is the behavior of dust grains. As you would expect, whenever you have dust grains in the, in the disk, those dust grains will tend to uh, settle toward the disk midplane. So they will tend to form a very thin disk uh, in the disk midplane. But this uh, settling motion is going to be compensated by the fact that you have turbulence. So in the end of the day, you will get an equilibrium between settling and turbulent diffusion in the vertical direction. So if somehow you manage to measure directly the thickness of the, of, uh, the dust disk inside this object, you can have an indication of how strong turbulence is. And this has been done in two occasions. The first one is just a sort of uh, geometrical argument. We know that these disks um, are um, forming rings, and these rings are observed actually in the dust emission, it's not the gas emission. So whenever you see a ring, uh, and there's pretty pictures, where, what you actually see is a ring of dust, not a ring of gas. Now, if you say that the dust uh, disk is uh, geometrically thick, then you should see something like that on the left. And if you say that the dust disk is geometrically thin, you should see something like that. Now, if you look carefully, the, the disk is seen inclined here. If you look at, at the, the width of the gaps, you can see that the width of the gap inside the thin disk layer is actually pretty constant. While the, in the thick uh, disk case, you almost uh, lose, uh, you, almost, you almost doesn't see the, the gap uh, in this particular orientation while you see a wide gap in this particular orientation. So, of course, that's purely geometrical, as you can see in this animation. But what is clear is that if you can measure the width of the gap as you move as you move around the disk, uh, then you can deduce the thickness of the dust layer. And that's what's been done for the famous HL tower image, where you can pretty clearly see uh, the gap. And you can see that despite the fact that the disk is seen inclined, you can always see the gaps uh, as you move around the uh, cell. That means that you are more in a thin disk configuration than in a thick disk configuration. So what we see here are really a dust disk, which is very thin. Uh, and if you put numbers behind that and you do a radiative transfer calculation, you can deduce that the thickness of the disk layer needs to be smaller than 0.01. Okay, so that's a very, very thin disk. And that indicates that you have a very strong uh, dust settling inside the disk. So that's, you could say that, you know, that's relatively indirect uh, evidence. You could say that, well, maybe um, um, there, there is something funny happening here, for instance. So you would, you would like to have a more reliable measure of the dust layer. And this has been done once more in the HH30 uh, image, in the HH30 object, sorry, which is again uh, in gray here, seen uh, by HST. So we see the scattered light, we see the disk, that's the disk surface, which is here. And the red stuff here is uh, the same image, but seen by ALMA in continuum emission. And what's, what is seen is actually the emission of the dust layer, 
due to uh, millimetric size grains. And as you can see, the dust layer is as thin as you could imagine. It's actually barely resolved. So as you can see, the disk turns out to be pretty thick um, if you look at, at the gaseous disk and at very small grains which can be floating above the disk. But if you look at, at dust grains which can actually be settling, these dust grains have settled very much into, into the mid plane. So once more, you can put constraint on what should be the level of turbulence here. And you did use uh, levels of alpha, which needs to be less than 10 to minus 4, which is uh, fairly small. So to conclude, um, well, on a theoretical point of view, uh, we can see that the disks are very weakly ionized. That leads to non-ideal MHD effects. And that means that MHD turbulence will be too weak most probably to explain the observed accretion rates. On an observational point of view, uh, it is seen that the, the line broadening due to turbulence is much smaller than the one expected from MHD turbulence. And vertical settling is very efficient. You, you, you get uh, dust disks which are much thinner than uh, the gaseous disk. So if turbulence exists, it must be much weaker than what is required by the turbulent or viscous disk model. So it turns out that uh, because of that, you are in a dead end. Um, you don't know what drives accretion in protoplanetary disk. And you would like to know whether or not it's somehow related to all of the structures we see. You, you remember all these rings and, uh, and spirals, etc. So uh, to me, one of the answer might be magnetized winds. And to explain that, um, I will start first with a little experiment, which I would like to do uh, for real in front of you, but well, can't. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a little movie of uh, this experiment, which is fairly simple. Um, we have an, amel an aluminum disc, which is going to play the role of um, our accretion disc and magnet. Uh, we take the disc um, and uh, we're going to put this disc in rotation. Okay. And next, we're going to impose a large scale magnetic field to this disc. And the disc as you all know, slow down and stops. So it's due to uh, Foucault currents. Okay, that's one thing. But if you say that now this disk is actually a gaseous disk orbiting around a central object, and if you slow down this disk, matter is going to fall onto the central object. In other words, the angular momentum has been extracted uh, by the fact that you have a mean field threading the disk and has been evacuated. In this particular experiment, the angular momentum is evacuated into uh, the magnet, um, which is standing above. Uh, in real life, it's going to be evacuated into the outflowing material from the disk. So <clears throat> this idea, of course, rely on the assumption that there is a large scale field threading the disk. So should there be a large scale field threading the disk? Well, if you believe in people doing uh, star formation, the answer is definitely yes. If you uh, look at the historical solutions of uh, Gallien Chu, of core collapse, then you see that these are uh, magnetic field lines and these magnetic field lines are dragged inward as the cloud collapse. So no matter what, in the end of the day, inside the disk, you expect to see a large scale field. If you believe in more recent numerical work uh, in the group of uh, Benoit Commerson, um, then um, you see here a disk forming and you see uh, the, the, the gray lines are the magnetic field orientation lines, and you see that you have a large scale field uh, threading the disk, which is also wrapped uh, as uh, the disk starts to uh, rotate and, and collapses. So uh, I would say that as an initial condition, uh, disks which are formed uh, around young star are definitely threaded by a large scale field. How does it save the day? Well. Uh, we can save the day because uh, you remember that we have this very thin layer at this surface in which there is not much material, but uh, this material is going to be sensitive to the large scale field and it's going to be slowed down by magnetic breaking because there is a large scale field. So one could say that you're going to have an accreting layer due to the large scale wind. And this accreting layer possibly will save the day. So the idea here is that you have a dead zone which is indeed definitely dead, in which there is not much magnetic coupling. And you have a disk surface, which is still coupled 
and which is accreting very fast because of uh, the existence of, ma of a magnetized wind launched from this, this surface. So that's the idea which has been developed uh, over uh, the last, say, seven to eight years um, by several people, including myself. So in order to demonstrate this uh, cartoon, um, what's been done is um, uh, numerical simulations, trying to explore this configuration and whether or not uh, one could have the right uh, accretion rates. So uh, typical simulations look like that. You have a disk seen from the side. Uh, you start with a, a field which is a large scale, uh, which is initially vertical. Inside of this, you include the non-ideal MHD effects which are uh, expected because of the ionization model. That means omic diffusion, whole effect and orbital diffusion. So because of that, the disk mid-plane is going to be mostly dead and uh, very diffusive. Uh, in the disk surface, you are going to assume that you are ionized because of, of uh, non-thermal radiation. So the, uh, the corona, so to say, is um, in ideal MHD. So if you uh, let that run uh, uh, for long enough, then you end up with this sort of result, which tend to confirm the cartoon I've just shown you. So what's shown here on the left are the fill lines in such a system, and on the right, these are uh, the streamlines. So first you see that the, the field which was originally vertical is bended out well, okay? And is almost straight inside the disk. On the right, you see that you have outflowing material from the disk surface here and here. You see also that uh, in the disk mid plane, you still have some sort of activity. It's, it's actually much smaller than what you would have in uh, usual MRI turbulence. Uh, because of diffusion. And in addition, something you might see or not here at the disk surface is um, a significant accretion streamer. You, there is another one here. So that's actually where accretion is taking place in this particular simulation. Okay, accretion is happening here at the disk surface. So, okay, that looks good. Now you can try to be a bit more quantitative. Um, so uh, you can ask, um, okay, what kind of accretion rate do we get out of this picture? So the accretion rate can be decomposed into a turbulence contribution because I, as I said, the turbulence is weak, uh, the alphas are relatively small, but still there is some turbulence. So there is some contribution of the accretion rate to, uh, of the turbulence to the accretion rate. And there is a contribution due to the large scale wind, which is extracting angular momentum from the disk. So what's shown here is a measurement of each of these uh, contribution as a function of time in a particular simulation. You can see that the blue dot is actually the uh, turbulent contribution and is always around zero. And the total mass accretion rate, which is in black, is uh, corresponds to uh, the, um, the, the, the wind contribution. So in this particular case, you see that uh, the wind is actually uh, responsible for the mass accretion rate. So uh, you can be, try to be a bit more, even more quantitative and deduce, for instance, scaling laws. Uh, and that's what's been done here. So what I show you here is a, is a result of a systematic exploration of all um, the, the parameter space, maybe not all, but a significant fraction of it. And you see that, um, if you say that you have a mean field which is fairly small, we are talking here about a few milligos. Um, uh, and if you consider a, a disk surface density, which is around what you would expect at around 10 AU, then you get a mass accretion rate, which is something like 10 to minus eight. So uh, the, in the end of the day, uh, you can explain what the mass accretion rate we observe by assuming that there is a wind emitted um, by, uh, from, from a disk threaded by a relatively weak field here about one millicos. I would like to emphasize also that the mass accretion rate does not depend so much on the surface density. It really depends on the field strength. So that's why it's really magnetically driven. If you had an alpha disk, then you would, you would see that it is the surface density which is, controlling the, the, which is controlling the mass accretion rate. It is not the case here. It's really the field strength, which is key uh, in this formula. Of course, as I said, um, um, there's are winds, so it means that some mass is lost uh, during the process. And you may ask, what 
how much mass is actually what lost in the wind. Um, and this is quantified by measuring what's called the, the ejection efficiency. So the mass loss rate is technically, technically defined as how much mass is lost uh, through uh, the disk surface. Uh, that's defined by this integral here. So that's technically, uh, if you look at this picture, it's how much mass is leaving the disk between R in, which is arbitrarily defined, and the radius I'm looking at. Okay, so that's the definition of the mass loss rate. Now, from this definition, you can compute the ejection efficiency. That is um, essentially how much mass is, how you compare the total mass lost in the wind to the mass which is accreted here at the outer boundary. Okay, and it turns out that in all of the simulations which have looked at this problem, including uh, the one which I've explored systematically, at the parameter space, we find that the efficiency is very close to one. It's, cl it's smaller than one, but it's close to one. It means that if you compare the mass lost in the wind to the mass which is accreted here, it's of the same order of magnitude. It also means that, of course, by uh, mass conservation, the mass accretion rate you would measure onto the star can be much smaller than the mass accretion rate which is actually coming in because most of it has been lost in the wind. Uh, that's key because if you remember, in these observation of HH, HH30, we had a mass loss rate in the molecular outflow which was larger than the one expected uh, onto the central star. Well, here we are in the same situation, okay? And that's what you recover uh, in the simulations. Okay, so we have a quite massive outflow. We have accretion rates which are compatible um, with uh, what is observed. So now the question is, um, what's happening to the dust grains? And uh, can we confirm or not that we have a, a very efficient settling in this scenario? That's what's been done by my postdoc, uh, Antoine Riel, over the last few years. Uh, here is an example of uh, one of, his, of his simulations, which shows uh, the gas here uh, um, in a, in a two, 2D uh, plot. And we have added good dust grains in, in this uh, simulation. And this is a plot showing the dust grain distribution. As you can see, the dust grains are much more concentrated into the midplane compared to the gas. Now, uh, you can make a more uh, quantitative comparison uh, between um, the thickness of the gas layer. So you plot uh, the density, the Z, uh, shown here, so the blue line corresponds to the density, uh, the gas density as function of altitude. Uh, so that defines essentially the thickness of the gas disk. Uh, next, we have in orange the constraint uh, deduced from ALMA for the thickness of the dust layer. So you can see that it's much thinner than the gas disk. And finally, we have uh, uh, the, the non-ideal simulation, so this one in red, which you can see matches pretty well uh, the ALMA constraint. And the purple uh, line corresponds to uh, the ideal MRI simulation, so if you assume that you are fully ionized, of uh, Sébastien Froment. And you can see that the ideal MRI simulation is actually lead to a much thicker dust layer. So a uh, bottom line is that the level of turbulence we have in these models are uh, compatible with what we observed in terms of dust settling. Um, but there is uh, a cherry on the cake. Um, as you might guess already here, uh, you might already see that uh, the density is not really distributed homogeneously in the radial direction, but we have bumps radially, as you might see here. Now, uh, because of course these are simulations, I need to show a, a movie. And here's an example of a movie of a simulation of uh, William Bethune, uh, in which we see the density, the magnetization, magnetic field lines and streamlines um, at the same time. And what you might see if you look at the density is that you start to form these rings. And you might see that if you look at the magnetization, that is um, essentially the plasma beta, you see the same ring-like features. This simulation is 3D. So the fact that the rings are perfectly circular is a result of the 3D simulation. So you can see that, you know, this, this, this shape is reinforced as, as time goes on. And uh, this has triggered the question of 
whether or not the rings we see in almost all of these objects could actually be a result of what we see in these simulations, in which I would like to emphasize there is absolutely no planet. Um, and uh, so we did try that. Um, we did a systematic exploration and we found that indeed wind emitting disks uh, such as these ones are actually prone to a secular instability. So namely uh, the disk and in particular the fill lines which are threading the disk do not want to stay homogeneously distributed but instead tend to accumulate into narrow regions. So that's what's shown here in this, um, in this plot in which we see the magnetic field lines in the same simulation. And you see that the magnetic field lines get concentrated into very narrow regions, here, here, and here. So um, you can compare that to the density plot and you see that the field lines are actually concentrated into the gaps of, of the flow. So we have derived a sort of, of a theoretical explanation to that, which is essentially a sort of a secular instability of load flow in which, so I won't go into the details here. I don't really have time, oops. Uh, but the point is that the outflow tend to naturally be unstable on a relatively long time scale and produces gaps in which the polaroid magnetic field gets concentrated. And that naturally explains why you have so many wings and gaps in all of the systems. If you believe that winds are actually driving accretion in their systems, then it's quite unavoidable to have uh, gaps and wings uh, just as a result of wind-driven accretion. Okay, uh, I will wrap up. Um, so uh, the main uh, message is um, you should take away from, from this seminar, if any, uh, is first that observations of different kinds uh, tend to indicate that disks are weakly turbulent, but are still accreting. So that called the question of why they are accreting, how they are accreting. Now, if you include all of the non-ideal MHD effects, uh, then you get what's called an extended dead zone, which is much wider than what was anticipated in the 90s. And only the disk surface actually sees the magnetic field and most of the disk is actually very diffused and therefore dead for MHD turbulence. Now it's possible to reconcile uh, the observed accretion rate to the lack of, of turbulence. If you say that uh, there is a magnetized wind which is launched from the disk surface which we see here, if you do that then you have, you get roughly the right accretion rate with a weakly turbulent disk midplane. And showing on the cake, it turns out that these wings are unstable on secular uh, timescales so that um, they don't stay homogeneous, but instead uh, you get ring-like features in which uh, in the gaps you get concentration of polyoidal field lines. Um, that's it. Uh, so I thank you for your attention and uh, I will take questions if, if there are any. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, Geoffroy. So are there some questions? I see Jean-Pierre. Jean Jean yes, uh, thank you, Geoffroy, for this, as usual, uh, fantastic mm. lecture. And uh, I think the, the final part when you talk about the gaps is, of course, fascinating because the gaps were, at the beginning, attributed to planet formation, but it was considered to be unlikely because these disks are too young. But in the end, when you will have planet formation, how this magnetic winds, do they play a role in this or it is unrelated? What, because this is a protoplanetary disk, so what is the role of, the, of your magnetic winds in uh, planet formation? Uh, that's something which is still, which still needs to be explored in details. Uh, it has uh, many roles. Um, first, because uh, it allows you to have a weakly turbulent uh, midplane. It decreases uh, the typical dust velocities and that tends to favor settling and therefore it accelerates planet formation. That's one thing. Uh, next, once you have formed the planet, the planet is going to migrate. Um, in the in the in the disk community, uh, all of the models of planet migration rely on viscous disk models. 
Uh, if you say that uh, accretion is due to winds, then it turns out that uh, the torques of, of planet migration are affected. There is a recent paper showing that uh, actually planet migration might be reversed when you have a wind-driven accretion. Uh, so that's still something which needs to be explored. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to tell. It is changing many things. Um, how quantitatively? I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thierry Montmer, I see that uh, Thierry Montmer has got many commentaires. Hello, uh, Geoffroy. That was very Hello, refreshing for a confined person away from Grenoble and from IEP, actually. Uh, okay, I take, uh, just like Jean Pierre, your last slide and the structures, the ring structures. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a simulation, of course, there's always the same problem. You, you run a simulation with a number of rotations and then you see how the magnetic field structure behaves. But what about longer time scales, like a million years, for instance, which would be typically the age of a Titari star or something like that. So you, you're speaking of millions of rotations. And I would assume that in this case, the magnetic field will be tangled very much, even if it reaches a sort of stationary structure. And so this could be linked with the ejection of the, of the material. But I would like to know how far, in other words, the other aspect is how long can you run a simulation that could still be valid after many, many, many uh, uh, orbits. And the second possibly related question is, uh, could you explain spiral structures in that case, or would they be uh, like in the galaxies, perhaps uh, subject to some external influence that we we haven't seen in these uh, in these stars. The fact that the stars are in clusters, so the external gravitational fields may may interfere with the uh, the ring structure, the perfect so quote unquote perfect ring structure that mm -hmm. you develop in your simulations. Yeah. Uh, so for the first question, you're right. Uh, we cannot evolve uh, numerical simulation for for millions of years. Uh, that's um, impossible to achieve uh, at the moment. So typically what can be done is um, a few 10,000 years, not more. Um, that might change. Um, the, so what you would like to do if you want to, do, to, to evolve these systems for uh, a very long time scale is to have something like an alpha disk model, but for wind. Uh, so in other words, you know, some sort of prescription you can plug in and then uh, on which you can compute the evolution of million or, or millions of years. Um, it's not there yet, uh, but uh, we are working on it. Uh, and the idea is, you're right, to compute the evolution on, on, on you know, millions of years. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, for, from brute force numerical simulation, clearly it's out of question for the next 20 years. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, for the, the spiral waves, uh, you're right, uh, spiral waves, no matter what need, I mean, to exist, need some sort of perturbation in the systems. Uh, the perturbation can have several origins. It can be an external perturber, say, um, uh, either a binary system, um, which can be inside the disk or outside the disk. Uh, it can be an embedded planet, it generates spirals. It can be an embedded vortex, uh, which, which also generates spirals. Um, my guess is that most of the spirals, and um, last but not least, it can be self-gravitating disks when the disk is sufficiently massive. Um, my, my, my personal take on that is that it's most probably either planets or vortices. Uh, vortices, why? Because most of the time spiral waves are observed in uh, systems which are, in which you have wide cavities uh, and uh, these wide cavities are prone to uh, vortex formation. And it's, it's actually most of the time where you see a spiral, you also, also see something which is like a banana shaped structure, which is probably related to a vortex. So, that, that's one thing. It can also be a planet which is perturbing the disk and, and producing um, a, a spiral. Um, it's not seen here because uh, the disk is, uh, there is no large cavity 
opened yet. Uh, I have a student working on disks which, with cavities, but I've not shown them uh, here. So whenever you start to introduce, you know, more complex disk structure with a cavity, then you get rings and you also get uh, spiral waves. Uh, but it's linked to the secular time scale evolution. Um, so the answer is, uh, at the moment we've just this simplified this model, you will not get any spiral wave, uh, maybe by construction. You need more complexity, which can be planets, vortices, transition disks, uh, or external perturbations. Okay, thanks, Sir Geoffroy. It was an uh, enlightenment. <laughs> Thank you. Johan, you have a question, I think. Oui, merci Geoffroy pour ton talk, c'était vraiment très clair. Uh, so I asked the question, uh, I have uh, two questions on the dust. Uh, you showed the, your comparison of the, um, of the one with ideal and non-ideal MHD uh, mm -hmm. with dust for the disk, uh, for the dust scale height. Um, so ca can you maybe explain a bit more because the, the ST parameter is the stoke uh, parameter, yeah. I, I imagine. Mm -hmm. So you have the same stoke uh, in the two configurations. So how comes, I, I'm not sure I understand why the uh, scale height should be different uh, between two rows. So uh, no, it's, uh, the so, stopping time is the same, right? Yes, the stopping time is the same, precisely. So, um, okay, so the stokes number, yes, uh, I did not discuss that. Um, the stokes parameter is uh, um, um, a dimensionless number which uh, essentially tell, which compares uh, the, the friction time of the dust grain to the orbital time of the dust grain. Okay, uh, and it can be related to uh, the size of the dust grain, uh, if you know uh, the, the, the gas density. Uh, so physically speaking, uh, when you look at uh, ALMA images, which show essentially millimetric size grains, uh, it means that since we are talking about 10 AUs, it means that you are looking at dust grains with a stoke number, which is 1.01. So that's one thing. So ALMA image is stocks 0.01 grains. Okay. Now, uh, there's, uh, two, um, there's two results here. So the, 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 the two, there's two simulations. The only difference between the two is essentially the presence of non-ideal MHD effects. In the, in the first one here, uh, sorry, in the, in the second one, uh, it's ideal MHD, okay? So what you have here is fully developed MRI turbulence. And ionization fraction is one. So the disk is fully ionized. If you do that, then you get very efficient turbulence steering and your Stokes one crane turns out to be floating inside the disk, okay? It's almost homogeneously distributed inside the disk. That's what this plot tells you. But, now, but you then, it, to, so, so may, maybe I can just interrupt, but then it should turn into a change in, in the stock number, or no? The stopping time changes? No, 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 no. The, fa the, the stopping time, so that's the stopping time computed in the mid plane. Of course, the stocks number is going to uh, vary with height, so that's stocks number in the mid plane. Uh, the stocks number is, is only defined by, um, the friction time of the dust grain. So it's really, it's geometrical size. It has nothing to do with turbulence. Uh, Stokes, Stokes number is just defined by the orbital time scale and uh, the friction time scale of the dust grains. And that's it. So whether yeah, you are the, turbulent- But, but in, the, in the stopping time, you have a dependency with, uh, I don't know what you consider for a stopping time, if it's a, a due to magnetic field or just collisions, but the, uh, this uh, this stock number changes with the scale height, probably, or with the yes, height. it does change with the scale height. That is true, but um, that's I mean, it's not the fact that there is turbulence or not does not change that fact. I mean, you have a profile, if you wish, of of uh, Stokes number, uh, but whether you are turbulent or not, it, it's there is no real impact. Uh, so the stopping that implies that it's this profile that makes the change in the disk scale height of the dust is this profile of the stopping time as a function of z that changes the, the, the dust uh, thickness of the disk is that true? no what i what i what i mean here is that you have a profile of stopping time if you want but there is no need to have such a profile to get this effect it's just a question of you have vertical gravity which tends to put the dust in the mid plane if you had no turbulence the dust would be razor thin 
Okay, it would all be settling in the mid plane. Uh, and there's no question of stopping time here. If you wait for long enough, if you have no turbulence, everything settles down in the mid plane. Uh, now, if you add turbulence, then you're going to diffuse away dust in the mid plane and it's going to, to get thicker. Um, now, the question is how thick you're going to get. And this is uh, set by turbulence. Uh, the more turbulence you would have, or the more the more efficient, if you wish, um, or the more effective diffusion you have, the thicker the disk, the dust disk is going to get. Okay, I understand. But then the gas, the gas uh, thickness will change as well, right? No, the gas thickness is uh, not set by turbulence. It's set by uh, ah, the sound speed. Only. It's it's it is set by by the temperature. So by the the thermal okay. pressure. There okay. is no thermal pressure for those things. Okay, I see. No, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, and, and just uh, another question uh, on this. The, uh, the dust, uh, I don't know what you use, but uh, it's, maybe it's a single uh, grain size uh, that you have. Uh, what, what, what does it change if you consider a full spectrum of uh, grain sizes? What does it change? Uh, for so, product? actually, uh, the, the simulation is done with uh, several bins of sizes, um, ranging from stocks to 10 to minus three to one. Um, uh, it doesn't change much. Um, uh, the, the only thing which can be changed is um, whenever um, the, the, the large grain tends to settle very much in the mid plane, then you, get, you start to get um, streaming instabilities because then the um, the dust mass becomes, I mean, the dust density becomes of the order of uh, the gas density, and then you start to get streaming uh, instabilities and the kind of stuff uh, um, you have in planet formation scenarios. Uh, this is not resolved here. So uh, essentially what you have is the bigger grains tend to settle to have the, 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 the cell which is in the mid plane and then nothing really happens. Uh, if you were to actually zoom in, what you would see is some sort of clumping happening in the disk. Uh, but it's not at rest here. But those simulations are done with uh, uh, several sizes of, of those grains. Yes. I'm showing here just one. That's pretty cool. Thank you. OK, thank you. I see no other questions. Maybe I have one short one about the ALMA results that uh, you show the very famous uh, picture of uh, HL uh, ton uh, and uh, mm -hmm. the conclusion that you can obtain that it's, uh, it's a thin disk. Up to now, how, how many similar disks were observed with ALMA? Are they, they, they give more or less the same result? And how many disks could we uh, expect ALMA we observe? Tens, hundreds, thousands? Uh, there is a, a large variety of um, uh, of disks of uh, disks showing um, uh, this sort of thing. So here is an example. Um, uh, so that's a result from the D sharp survey. Um, and uh, I don't know if I can zoom in. Yeah, so that you can see a bit better. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, these are all Alma images um, of uh, these families. And you can see that you have gaps wings all over the place, which are fairly axisymmetric. Um, and uh, to please Jean-Pierre, you might see some spiral waves here. No, uh, it was Thierry who asked me that. Uh, some spiral waves here in this, uh, in, in loop it. Um, so it's, it seems like it's, uh, it's very common. I would say it's almost systematic. Okay. So HL2 was not just like, it was just one. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I see we have a question also of Rafael Duc. Please, Rafael. Yeah, just uh, one quick question. I was wondering about the emission and the radiation transfer in the disk. Um, so in the ionized layer, which is outside of the disk where the Foucault currents are dissipated, can this uh, induce some additional heating of the disk and does it change the temperature that you observe? Or is there any consequence on the radiation from the, from the disk? In your model? Yes, yes, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so indeed, uh, the fact that you have accretion in the uh, upper layer lead to uh, some local heating. Um, uh, and uh, it, 
it can uh, possibly heat up um, uh, the disk surface. Uh, so this has been looked into uh, by at least two papers I know. Um, uh, and uh, the result is that you can um, increase uh, the, the, the temperature by, uh, at the, so at the disk surface by something like 50%. Um, it really depends on uh, the details of how high is the layer uh, what kind of um, of resistivity you you have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but uh, it, it's no more than 50, 60 percent of the temperature of the initial temperature, say, so the, the one you would not, you would have without any heating. Uh, so it does it does heat. Uh, the original intention was to um, get to temperatures which would be high enough to explain uh, some of the properties of uh, chondrites, um, which as you might know, are, um, uh, are subject to a periodic heating uh, or have been subject to periodic heating up to um, uh, 1,500 K uh, in the solar system. And, and the question was whether or not there's upper layers could actually uh, be responsible for that. The answer is no, because it doesn't heat sufficiently. Um, but this there is some would heating. be different from the alpha disk model. This would be a distinctive feature of this model. Yes, you would expect to have a heated uh, surface layer. Yes, yes. Okay. Thanks. I see no other questions, so I propose we stop here. Okay. Brian, Sandrine, close the session. Yes, donc merci beaucoup Geoffroy pour ce séminaire. C'était super intéressant. Je vais éteindre l'enregistrement.